Hi. With an introduction like that, I mean, let's see. Great. So uh, I think I said I'd talk about IoT and climate change, and I will get to that. But uh, this is a. I guess I want to start by asking if you have a few questions of the audience just to kind of get a feel for things. Um, how many of you, have been, has anyone here worked in the field of electrical energy at all? Not a lot. Um, how many people here are interested in climate change? And how many of you feel like, oh, those of you who just raised your hands, leave them up for a sec. Um, now, leave them up if you feel like you could decide to work in climate change as a career immediately. OK, cool. So uh, that's where I found myself about a year and a half ago, um, thinking about what is impactful to do, what I want to do with my life. And I realized that I have this firm belief that the thing that you spend the majority of your time on should be something you're passionate about. Um, so. I decided to, to quit my job and ask myself a few questions. Um, so this is a bit of background. Uh, I've already been pretty thoroughly introduced, I feel like. But uh, I work on this open source project. I manage it. And it's all about getting inclusivity and um, basically ease of design and development into hardware. Um, check out Tussle if you're interested in that. That's usually what my talks are on. Um, I, earlier this year, founded a company called Hackers Combating Climate Change, which I'll talk a little bit about in this book, or in this, uh, in this talk. And I'm currently spending most of my time working on a book to help you get from where I was a year and a half ago as an engineer, someone who's interested in working on impactful stuff, and realized I knew very little about climate change or the actual problems within it. Um, hope, hopefully, my book can help you get to where I am now a lot faster than I took. Um, basically explaining the basics of, of how, how to go from um, climate change as a problem to what are the specific problems within climate change that we can attack from a skill set to what are some specific projects to try next. Um, and all the, the smart grid part of this talk that I teased in the introduction and in the title is much more about one of the things that I would cover in this book, um, one, of, one of the problems that I decided to go with. And I'll talk to you a few more about that. So a year and a half ago, I started asking these questions. Um, how do I do something that matters? How do I use the skills that I already have to do something that matters? And what do I actually like? What do I want to do? Um, so this is a bit abstract, of course, but you've got the engineering sector. What am I already good at? What do I have community in? Um, got impact, what do I like, and decided that this is probably a good intersection of those things. Let's start a company to, to use engineering to fight climate change. Um, but this was completely new to me. I didn't know much about anything in terms of climate change. So I spent some time. This is actually Goodreads informs me. I've labeled 64 books as climate change, but these are the best ones, I think. Um, I'll tweet this out if you're interested. Um, then, after doing kind of the high-level view of what is climate change, what do people say about it, um, there's also a number of really good reports that you can read. You can be bogged down in PDFs for, I mean, literally forever, but also there's really interesting ones. This one shown here is uh, it's from the annual Energy Outlook report produced by the Energy Information Administration. And I swear to you, this 150-page document that is exactly this dense the whole way through is really fascinating if you can get into that. Um, and I was working with a partner on all of this um, who reminded me occasionally that, in fact, we were planning to start a company, not just research forever, um, and worked with him to do a few different ideas that we ended up not doing. And uh, I won't go into it. You can ask me about these later. But this is essentially four different ideas that we explored using uh, machine learning, IoT, uh, basically trying to reach customers immediately with financial modeling and tidal turbines for native villages in Alaska. Um, and we ended up not doing any of those for various reasons, um, which is a thing that is really important to learn how to do if you're going to do entrepreneurship, is to decide quickly what kind of impact you want to make, um, what kind of market there is, and how to determine quickly that your idea is a bad one. Um, 
And so this is what we ended up working on after, after about a year of trying different things. Um, this is the home page of hc3.io, which is the company that we co-founded. And it was to do with smart batteries. And the idea is to get batteries to become economically feasible to put in residences. Um, and how does that fight climate change exactly? Um, so this is going to be a challenging talk, because I only really have 30 minutes, and people get degrees on this stuff. Um, but essentially, the part of the climate change problem that we were trying to attack is to replace fossil fuels and electricity generation without decreasing the quality of service. Um, and I'll try to help you understand that uh, by, helping to exp by starting by explaining the grid. Um, so the energy, the energy grid is complicated. And it is different everywhere. And uh, you can imagine, you know how every company has a different stack. And uh, you end up spending most of your time when you, when you move to a new company or to a new project, you end up spending all of your time at least for the first several months, maybe a couple of years, trying to understand how you have implemented the thing that you're already doing, even if, even if the outcome of what your company produces is very similar to what another project you've worked on has done, it is very likely right, that the way that, the way that it is implemented, the way that the processes work, are all different from each other. Um, so that's kind of a long way of saying um, my knowledge about the electrical grid that I'll be presenting here Sorry, I know this is an international conference, but my knowledge is pretty much North American. And specifically, it's Californian. And specifically, it's mostly Southern Californian. Um, but the principles apply across the grid, at least the electrical parts. Um, and hopefully, this will give you a starting point if you're interested in understanding what kind of problems grids in general face. So talking about not decreasing the quality of service when you integrate renewables. Um, we have to first start by defining what is a high quality service. So the American energy grid delivers with about 99.97% uptime. Um, the average outage is something like three hours. And that's, a, I mean, that's not what you would normally, three hours in a year, I should say. Um, so we do very well at delivering energy to people. And we're not willing, as a culture, as an economy, we're not willing to decrease the quality of electrical energy delivery because we depend on it, right? So if you want to change the system, a system that has been built to accommodate a very specific type of infrastructure, you have to integrate new things, in this case renewables, in a way that doesn't change much to the end consumer, which is I mean, in a nutshell, that is one of the core problems of trying to fight climate change, is we're trying to change a system without actually changing the system that we experience. Nobody's willing to, to compromise, because you want, you want progress in time to feel like progress in technology. Um, so as an entrepreneur, the thing that's challenging is to try and figure out what is the niche where you can create a situ situation that is both better and more appealing. So, I'm trying to figure out how to, uh, so, so I, I was trying to figure out how to fix the grid in a way that didn't feel like, want to fix climate change? Go vegan. It's more like, you want to fix climate change? Eat this particular kind of meat that you already like. Um, so going into reliable, secure, and stable. Uh, reliable means able to withstand unplanned disturbances. So if a generator goes down, um, you need to be able to immediately swap in some new energy source, right? Uh, secure, so you'll think about like lines of distribution, you've got power poles, they can go down. If there is another set of power poles, which ideally there would be, you don't actually have any downtime. And this is presumably familiar concepts because this is universal to good engineering. Um, and then this third concept is stability. And this is the thing that's a little bit different in energy distribution versus other types of distribution. So. Um, electrical energy is often treated like a commodity in the market um, in that it has a specific and changing price per unit, usually kilowatt hours. Um, but it's not really a commodity in the same way that, say, having a container full of coal is a commodity. Like, coal, you have it, and you can ship it around, and it can sit there for a while, and it's still a container full of coal, right? 
but electrical energy is a bit more complicated because you need it to be based on specific timing. And I'll go into that a little bit more. Um, so specifically, this says able to keep generators running synchronously. And what does it mean for generators to run synchronously? Well, this is probably a bit familiar to you. Uh, this is the USA energy grid runs at 60 hertz. I bought an adapter so I can use your European 50 hertz, 230 volt system to charge my laptop. Um, this is the actual graph of the energy that's coming out, right? This is probably familiar to you. Nods, please. All right, great, thank you. <laughs> um, so physically, what that means is that we're generating electricity based on rotations that take uh, 1 60th of a second to get all the way around, right? So if you remember, this was high school physics, or I don't know, you probably call it something different here. Um, but you apply the right-hand rule, and you've got magnetic field going around, moving in a circle, and you create in a conductor a current that goes in a particular direction, right? Um, and that's how energy generation works. Um, this is the scale of an actual turbine that you might see. It's rather intimidatingly large. This is a steam turbine. Um, and that's typically what you would see in a coal, oil, natural gas plant, is they're going to heat up water until it produces steam, which then turns this massive thing, which has a lot of momentum. So you can imagine that you want it to basically keep turning all the time with as little adjustment as possible in order to not waste your energy. Um, so all of these are running at 60 hertz in the United States. And in fact, they're all running in the, with the same periodicity. They're not, even just, they're not even just like all running at the same speed. They have to all be running in sync with each other to be a stable producing grid, because as you recall, if you create the sine wave and then you create an opposite sine wave, it'll cancel out and you won't have what you need. Um, so this is, this is a map of generation plants in the United States, and the different colors are different types, but basically they all have to run at 60 hertz in sync with one another, which is insane, right? Like, that's, that's a lot. Um, technically, actually, they're not running all with the same periodicity. The little, this is the energy grid, and you can see the little triangle points are where they adjust the periodicity. Uh, it's, it's not important, but I did want to be technically correct here. Um, so this is cool. Um, all of that stuff is running at 60 hertz, and you can watch, actually, in real time. This is a map measured by citizen scientists and apparently the University of Tennessee of the frequency that you're actually observing on the grid at different points. Uh, this is current, and you can see that it changes a lot. I want you to notice, the laser is that one. Um, I want you to notice the range here. Like, the far end is 59.94, and the, this far end is 60.06. .06. That range is extremely precise. If you're out of range for too long, like out of even this small range, that giant generator, the one that looked really expensive, that breaks after like 10 minutes of being about that far off of the center. Um, so it's really, really important that we're able to keep the generators running synchronously and stably. And you can see, um, like, Right now, here in my home area, it's running a little bit slow, which means that the load is too, let's see, yeah. The load is too high for the generation right now, whereas over here on the East Coast, the load is a little bit too low, which means that the generators are running just a little bit too fast. Um, and what I mean by that is maintaining frequency is about maintaining a specific balance of the generation and the load. Um, so this goes again back to this high school physics textbook type style thing. Remember that a circuit is connected, uh, V equals IR, so if you have a constant voltage, which you do, 110 volts in the United States, and you have um, a changing resistance, then the current's also going to vary. But we actually need the current to not vary because of that stability aspect, which means that we need to change the generation speed of the magnets, we need to change the rotation to match the load in real time. And in this case, the load is like, this projector is, a is part of the load, and that light over there is part of a load, and if you left the lights on in your hotel room, that's part of the load. And you could be turning that on and off at any time, and so could thousands and thousands of other endpoints. Um, and so in order to keep 
all of these generators running at exactly the same speed in sync with one another, there has to be, on the generator end, because your load is unpredictable, there has to be minute adjustments all the time of those massive generators to match the tiny changes that you're making. So that's a little bit on stability. Um, so the challenge that we see usually with uh, integration of renewables is one of reliability, so ensuring that enough energy is produced. So there's this concept, right, that if you were to do, uh, if, if you were to think about solar and wind, one, one basic way to think about it would be like, okay, so we have this coal plant, and then we have solar, and if we just reduce, or if we just increase the amount of solar that's available, then we can decrease the coal and natural gas or whatever it is by that same amount. Um, but that turns out to not be exactly correct. Um, so this is what it looks like to introduce uh, solar and wind into the California electric grid. So you've got this blue line is the total load. That's the demand we see. And normally, or prior to renewables, this would all be met by the same, like what we would call conventional generation. So mostly coal and oil and natural gas. Um, when you introduce solar, you do this interesting thing where suddenly you can cut out the middle a little bit, right? But you still have these peaks on both ends. And so that means that you still have to have the generation capacity, especially for this high point at the end, which is the highest point in the day. You still have to be able to match that without solar. So you end up having to have much more generation capacity, actually, than you previously needed. And you don't necessarily decrease the need for coal, oil, or natural gas. You actually have a problem where um, it might be more cost effective because of those giant turbines, it might be more cost effective to just leave the turbine running. Um, sometimes that's what happens is you'll just leave that turbine running while solar is coming in and you feel like you've done a really good thing because you put solar on your house, but it might not have had an effect. Um, so that's too bad. This is called, by the way, the duck curve. I didn't draw that, but I wish I did. Um, so if you ever heard the duck, the duck curve referred to, it is that particular curve. And this is showing projections. Um, this is from 2013. But it's showing projections of the increasing amount of solar in California's infrastructure. And uh, you'll notice that the peak is not going down. So it's not actually getting better without, without trying to fix it. So the way that people try and fix this is, well, OK, so we have solar energy generation, what if there was some way to flatten that double peak out and shift energy through time? Well, we do have that kind of technology. Um, it doesn't really look like that, but I cut out the other picture because this is a lot more evocative. Um, so if you, could, if you could shift energy through time, that's a battery, right? That's energy storage, that's flywheels, that's pumped hydroelectric up a hill. Um, the problem is that batteries are still pretty expensive. Um, so ideally, you would put, so this is a little bit of, uh, of a detour in the point. But so ideally, you'd put the batteries as far downstream as possible, right, to reduce the amount of load, because you don't want to. Um, you don't want to have high demand, for example, here, because you'd end up having to build extra infrastructure to cover the load when the demand changes down here still. Um, so how do we get the economics to work out to put a lot of batteries on the grid through putting them in residences? Um, so it turns out that although batteries currently don't pay for themselves, so remember that I mentioned that we did a solar consulting gig previously. So in January of this year, I spent a lot of time talking to homeowners in San Diego area um, and doing basically economic analysis for them of what it looks like to put solar on their homes. I did uh, essentially net present value calculations of 20 years out, like how much would it save or lose you to install a, say, $20,000 investment of, of um, solar panels on your roof right now. Um, and it turns out that if you live in San Diego, the bar is pretty low because the electricity costs are extremely high. They're about three times in San Diego what they are in, um, say, Seattle, where my parents live. Um, because Seattle's able to use hydroelectric, 
Whereas San Diego, which is a desert where no one should live, um, I'm not biased, um, <laughs> is not as good at providing resources for humans because it's not naturally a place where humans should inhabit. Um, so in order to reduce the cost, so, so when we were doing the solar consulting gig, one of the things that homeowners often asked while they were trusting us with their financial projections, one of the things they often asked was, well, so I've heard a lot about this Tesla, Elon Musk story. Solar means batteries too, right? Uh, and so we looked into whether people should get batteries in their homes. And the answer was a clear no from an economic standpoint. Um, the Tesla battery for the house is about $8,000 a pop. And uh, by the time you earned back that revenue, the battery would already be much below its capacity. Um, but one of the things that's really important when you're studying entrepreneurship, ooh, what happened? All right. Um, one of the things that's really important to pay attention to when you're studying entrepreneurship is to look at technology trends. And something that's happening and facilitated by Elon Musk, thanks Elon, is uh, the price of, of uh, lithium ion batteries is dropping pretty quickly. So we're coming to a point where it still doesn't totally make financial sense to put these in your house, but it's not too far in the future. And maybe if you could figure out a way for the batteries to make you money, rather than just sit there and absorb your demand and change the timing. Um, actually, I'll go into this slightly. So <laughs> I, I understand that utilities are very, very different in different countries. I was talking at drinks last night with um, someone from Sweden and someone from Germany, and um, our utilities are diff completely different from theirs, and theirs were different from each other. Um, but I'm, I'm guessing there exists a concept of time of use in a lot of different areas. Is this familiar? Um, essentially, the idea is, you remember that duck curve had like low points during the evening and high points during, uh, specifically during middle of the day and evening time when people come home and make dinner. Um, well, so the time of use theory is that you can change consumer behavior based on changing the price at a given time. And this works in Hawaii right now. Um, I, know, I was talking to someone recently whose mother lives in Hawaii, and he said, yeah, she doesn't cook dinner until like 9 p.m. every night because energy just costs too much during normal dinner time. Um, personally, I don't know whether to find that story inspiring or kind of sad because it's really like it's having a huge impact on how people change the way they live. So one thought with the batteries was, well, what if you could get something that made it so that you could live a normal life? Um, and I mean normal, but um, so that you could live a life along the schedule that makes sense to you without having to pay crazy amounts for electricity, but also to not increase demand during peak times. Um, so the main way that batteries currently are sold, and this is including Tesla's battery, is that they can change the time of use so that they charge during the night when electricity is cheap and they deploy to your house when it's expensive. Um, and even that doesn't actually add up to the $8,000 right now, not in California. But it's close. And it's close enough that if you could sell a service back into the grid, which is a thing, it turns out, um, you could make the battery pay for itself. And so specifically, I'm talking about stability. So remember I was talking about um, how frequency regulation needs to happen every time you turn off a light and turn it on again. But if you could integrate those demands into something much more amenable to how the grid wants it to be. So you will remember the map, how it was red in some parts and blue in other parts, and how both of those were actually bad because you want it to be right in the middle at green. Um, you need in real time to be able to adjust the grid to the exact frequency, right? If you were able to have knowledge at all those different points of the grid, and if you were able to have smart batteries understanding what demand was looking, at, looking like coming in from different areas, you could, in theory, change the way that demand works so that the frequency wouldn't actually change on the generator end. Um, let me try to rephrase that. I'm seeing some confused faces. Uh, so theoretically, if I'm in my house and I turn a light on, there might be someone else who's on a similar part, the same part of the grid as me that's connected further up who is turning a light on right as I turn mine off. 
Um, or maybe they do it three seconds later. Or what is going on? I like the, I like the green stripe part. That's the worrying part. Um, Anyway, essentially, it means that if you had a battery that understood that the, the, the frequency of the grid should be x, that the man should stay, frequent, should, should stay constant across time, um, you could, in theory, manipulate those batteries to anticipate the needs of the genera generators so that the turbines would not need to turn on and off so often, which, by the way, is very expensive for the generators and thus expensive for the utilities and thus expensive for the homeowners. Um, so there exist some market mechanisms, at least in California utilities, and this is still an area of active legislation, um, but it is an area of active legislation where they're defining ways for different levels of company and individuals in some respects, or in, in some cases, to be able to participate in actively managing what demand looks like. So there's, this isn't for frequency regulation, but for demand response, which is more so frequency regulation is like real time on the order of seconds and minutes. And demand response is more along the lines of the huge duck curve throughout the day. Um, if you have the ability to shift a certain amount of load, so say you have a factory and a battery installed at it, uh, like enough battery banks that you could change when, when that entire amount of energy that your factory uses charges, you can bid into the grid and say, hey, whenever you ask it of me, I will shift this much load to whenever you need it from me. Um, so this is really interesting. Um, this means that it becomes possible for companies to actively participate in changing the way that the grid operates, it, to change the way like, that the grid can use electricity, um, basically reducing the maintenance costs and, in theory, then reducing the cost of electricity for everybody. Um, and all that depends on is having a lot of capacity to change, like, basically it depends on getting a lot of batteries out or other energy storage mechanisms. Whoa. This is new. All right. Um, so if we can sell this kind of reliability and stability to the grid, we can, in theory, subsidize batteries and get them out into the marketplace more quickly. Um, what that depends on, of course, is us being able to have really strong two-way communication between the batteries and the utilities and the generators and the grid. It turns out there's a lot of entities along that stack, um, and it's definitely going to be different no matter where you are. Um, but if we're able to have a managing authority that is aware of the changing needs of the grid in real time, and we also have authorities that can receive commands and manipulate energy need in real time, we can match those up, and that looks like an IoT problem. Um, that looks like this kind of thing. This is installed in, I think, every residence in California. This is a smart meter, um, and it reports data back to the utility at all times. And right now, it's not a bi-directional thing, but like, it could be. There's no reason you couldn't put this Linux box and radio to work communicating in every direction, right? Like, this is just your basic microprocessor with a radio on it. Um, and you know how to write for that. I mean, like, maybe you do. You could learn. Um, and so we use these for reliability. And I was learning, apparently, in Sweden, you actually, as a homeowner, you're allowed to look at this data. In the United States, I've never heard of anybody being able to, like, check an app on their phone to find out what their energy looks like, which I think is silly. But um, if we get entrepreneurship into that space, then maybe that becomes a possibility. So that gets us to essentially solving that one problem of how do we integrate renewables into the grid. If we want to be able to have renewables that actively, actually displace coal, oil, natural gas, and other resources that we've traditionally depended upon, we need another way to, to guarantee that the grid will remain reliable and stable and secure. Um, and this is one path. This is one entrepreneurship engineering solution to getting to that point. Um, so that's what, that's what HC3 is working on. I actually really enjoyed doing the research for these companies. And I, 
uh, sort of obsessively took notes the entire time. Actually, let me just show you. This is kind of ridiculous. Um, this is like the notes that I've been taking. It's online in a get book, but it's like, what do you want to know about? I took notes on all of it. <laughs> um, so because I did that, I decided I should probably write a book about it um, so that other people could get sort of to the same place without as much effort. Um, so if you're interested in that, I would love to continue explaining areas of opportunity. Um, you can check my notes out online. They're, so they're linked from that page. Um, but yeah, I think I'm out of time. So thank you very much for listening. I hope at least some part of this was interesting or useful to you. <laughs> <laughs> so you win the prize for the most questions. Um, there was an almost continuous Slack debate going on then on a number Thanks. of topics. <laughs> I'm not sure it's good. No, it is. Um, so I've tried to categorize them. I'm on about 25 questions so far. Um, <laughs> so I've tried to categorize them. Let's start. Um, about locations. So two questions, I think they're similar. Um, you talked a little about it, but specifically, wouldn't it be more efficient to have batteries at the source instead of at houses? Um, and then a similar question, uh, would it help to have the batteries close to the turbines to take the edge off the instability? So the question is, why, why at the houses? Why are the batteries at the, uh, at the houses rather than at, say, turbines? Yes, good, thank you, because I definitely glossed over that one. Um, so there's actually a really good research paper that comes out of the Rocky Mountain Institute talking about this. But essentially, um, if, you have, if you have energy storage really close to the generation, that's great. You can achieve a lot of the reliability issues. You can achieve a lot of the um, frequency stabilization issues right at the source. Um, and that's very good. But if you go one step further down, um, one of the things that happens in terms of um, in terms of security, where the, if you had power lines go down, you'd have a problem. Um, one of the things that happens is that you have to create a system that is able to sustain. Um, it's not just whether or not there's a wire there. It's whether there's enough wire there to not exceed engineering boundaries, right? And so you end up having to super overbuild these systems. I think they're usually designed to support at least twice as much load as they're ever going to expect to see. Um, and if you get to that end of that um, duck curve, where it's the highest point in the day, it turns out that you could easily overload the lines. One thing that I didn't mention is happening is that um, most of the integration of renewables is actually not decreasing the need for energy. It's like the need for energy is just growing and growing more and more massively. So we end up needing to continue building more infrastructure. Um, and if we're able to reduce the use of the infrastructure as far down the line as possible, uh, we also are able to decrease costs. Did that make sense? Yes. Thanks. <laughs> um, there's a lot of people concerned about hacking. I think yes. we're on eight questions on this now. Um, so I'll read the questions as they are. Um, so wouldn't someone hacking the batteries be able to disrupt the grid to cause massive damage? Yes, absolutely. There? Yeah, that can happen. Um, Good. <laughs> I mean, so that's... That's like, oh, I don't know what you want me to say there. Like, that's, that is the danger of the IoT, and that is the direction things are going. So use secure practices, um, but I don't think you can stop this kind of change from occurring. Um, I also think that we're already fairly at risk for that. I read a book recently about the CIA, and they did some testing on, um, on American infrastructural projects, and the security there is basically worthless, is what they learned. Um, continues to be. I don't think they fixed it. Um, if you wanted to shut down the American energy grid, you probably could, like if you were determined. Um, so having the batteries, yeah, I mean you could do, you could do damage there as well. But like, the problem exists anyway. Um, we should be more secure in general, and that's pretty much the whole takeaway. <laughs> That's a fair answer. All of the questions then on different possible implications of hacking, from taking around the grid to setting fire in people's homes that you don't like to all sorts of things. So I'm going to swarm all over that. <laughs> um, uh, it's a different angle. Um, have you investigated um, the bunch of proposals for blockchain-based smart grid systems? I am definitely not an expert in that topic and okay. don't even understand the question. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> I like the honesty. Um, 
Uh, does the swarm of IoT batteries rely on a central authority sending instructions to the devices, or could you decentralize that? That's a really interesting question. So one of the things that happens now, there's a company called Advanced Microgrid Systems, and they do something very similar to what, what HC3 is proposing to do. Um, and that is, instead of putting it in houses, they put it at industrial plants and commercial plants, um, which is easier because they have more demand concentrated in one spot. And um, Sorry, what was the question again? Distributed yes. control. <laughs> um, so the thing that they currently do is they have a brain that does predictive analytics on the needs of the production plant and also on the needs of the grid, which they essentially are able to map from the changing price of electricity at a given node. Um, just go with that. Um, anyway, they end up having to recalculate, I think, they're recalculating every 10 minutes what they expect the grid to do mm. for the next week, and then they deploy that every 10 minutes to all of their different brains. Uh, in that case, that is a deployed system that is reliant on a, on a single centralized brain, and I think it's probably, at some, at some level, I think it is necessary to have a single centralized brain in order to process the... the um, Basically, you want to know what all the parts of the system are doing at once in order to optimize, right? Mm -hmm. um, so to the extent that you're able to optimize that system, yeah, I think it's really useful to have a single centralized brain that knows all the parts. That makes sense. <laughs> um, could all the people discussing how we can blow things up with this please stop? It's just, just causing my Slack to scroll. There's lots of people who want to blow stuff up with these. I mean, so here's the thing about blowing up batteries, right? Like, yeah, you can, but like, if you're a good engineer, <laughs> you've probably built some fail-safe into your system such that, like, fail-safe, but like, um, you shouldn't have the part that lets you overcurrent your device be the part that is controlling the, what the battery's behavior is, right? That should be, the, like, the thing that should happen with regards to your, con your hackable control mechanism is it should be on or off, right? It shouldn't be the thing that says, yeah, turn it on full blast, because you're pretty much going to have, like, not that kind of need. Like, you're, you're, you're going to need to say whether or not the battery should be discharging or charging, but you shouldn't be saying the number of milliamp hours over the internet. Like, that's not useful. <laughs> um, and the final group of questions, but I'll try and bring them together, is on the actual ecological impact of the batteries themselves. Yeah. All the way from, uh, somebody mentioned about lithium being a limited resource, the environmental cost of producing them in general, um, and also all the way through to the disposal of them uh, and how that can be ecologically damaging. Does all of that outweigh this, um, or where do you see that balance? Yeah, that's a really good question, and it's something that I am actively trying to learn more about. Um, one of the things that is, of course, challenging in climate change is that you have to balance problems against each other. I mean, you have to balance the cost of mining lithium versus the cost of the electricity. And at that point, you're not, you're not necessarily comparing carbon to carbon, right? You're comparing, um, is it better to put methane in the atmosphere versus mine lithium out of a, something that might cause water seepage? So you can't do a straight-up comparison like that. Um, there are some really valid concerns. One of the things we were originally looking at was trying to partner with um, an auto manufacturer. There, are some, there have been some experiments. I think it's GE has done the most work on, or maybe, maybe it was Ford, has done the most work on um, trying to repurpose car batteries because they usually need to be able to work on, in spikes, um, de depending on the car manufacturer. But they need to be able to work in a specific way versus stationary storage, which is, th this is more stationary storage, uh, has a rather different style of, like, whether or not the battery is still usable. And there's been a lot of experimentation in terms of, can we reduce the number of lithium-ion batteries that are needed, or at least, like, extend out their ability to have impact on the environment um, by, by reusing them for different purposes? And I've, I've heard pretty mixed reviews on getting new versus used and then whether it's worth it or not. But... Awesome. It's thank a good question. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, everyone.